Welcome to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. I'm your spicy host, Tara, and I'm here every episode to expose, uncover, and share what I know about SEX. This isn't what you find in your typical sex ed class. Juicy sex talk is under discussed, and I'm doing what I can to change that. Sex is evolving. People are empowered more than ever to detach from the cultural norms and design the sex life they crave. And hey, if you're looking for more after the show, I invite you to get social. My Instagram is the.sexed.show, and I would love for you to give me a follow. Today, we're diving into a conversation that explores the intricate connection between healing, grief, sensuality, and personal growth. Our guest today is a skilled facilitator in guiding individuals through these profound journeys. She's the founder of Beloved Coaching, a space dedicated to empowering individuals as they navigate their paths to wholeness. Jess, a fellow somatic sex educator, helps folks navigate grief and embrace their erotic being. With a passion for helping others heal, Jess has embarked on a mission to create a safe and nurturing space where her clients can find comfort, growth, and empowerment. We'll uncover the taboo-shattering aspects of her work and learn how she creates an atmosphere of trust and vulnerability, enabling her clients to address both the emotional and sensual dimensions of their lives. Whether you're currently navigating grief or simply seeking to expand your understanding of the connection between sensuality and healing, this episode promises to be an eye-opening and transformative journey. And before we get started, I'd just like to do my land acknowledgement. This is the place in which I sit, and I want to acknowledge that. In the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge that I live, work, play, and I am recording this episode on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Sutina Nation, the Stony Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. And typically, I do a somatic inquiry for folks who want to participate in it. If you don't, you can kind of just fast forward it. If you're driving, you probably want to fast forward it too. So I just want to invite you to take a moment to connect with yourself. You may want to close your eyes, soften your gaze, and just invite maybe 10% more pleasure into your body. Could be putting a pillow on your lap. It could be giving your body a little wiggle. And just take a few breaths. Whatever capacity feels right for you right now. Allowing your body to relax with each exhale. As you breathe, bring your awareness to the sensations in your body. Notice any areas of tension. Notice any areas of ease. Mm. Now consider this. How do you currently view the relationship between healing, grief, and your sensual self? Are there any aspects of your journey that you've hesitated to explore or embrace fully? Noticing your breath, noticing your body, and simply observing your thoughts, feelings as they arise. Allowing yourself to be curious about the connections that might exist within you. As we embark on this episode's journey, remember that healing is a multifaceted process. Our exploration today is meant to inspire understanding and growth. And when you're ready, your eyes are closed, you can gently begin opening them. And let your inquiry settle within you. Welcome, Jess, to 
the sex ed for the modern bed show. I'm so excited Yay. you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Also, I really needed that. So thank you. <laughs> I kind of needed too. it too. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, now I'm here. I'm, I'm more present. Probably yeah. going to cry, but here we are. <laughs> it's on it's on uh on theme <laughs> it's on theme right <laughs> oh, yeah I've been I've actually really wanted to have you on here for quite some time so I'm glad that this worked out for both of us and I feel like today's topic is I don't want to say taboo but something that some people are a little bit nervous to get into yeah yeah and I know for myself, like grief, it's, it hurts sometimes yeah. <laughs> and it's scary and it's often not nurtured. So I feel like opening this conversation up and kind of learning from you today and your experience with navigating this and holding space for people in this is really special yeah. I love talking about this shit <laughs> <laughs> well can you maybe share with our listeners a little bit about yourself and what you do and what you offer yeah so I similarly to Tara offer somatic sex education and sexological body work sex coaching, masturbation coaching, all of all of those good, good juicy things. And then I also in group facilitated space and soon to be one on one facilitated space offer embodied grief support. And so really advocating, <laughs> sometimes I say evangelizing because I like was mentioned, like we don't grief's a little taboo it's a little scary it's a little overwhelming and wanting to connect people to that real like important embodied human experience so that it can feel less scary and so regularly it's every other week I guess at this point like offer a mindful erotic grief practice that's online so people can come in from anywhere which has been really sweet like we've had people from different parts of Europe, all over North America, and a place to be with their bodies and their grief. But then almost every, <laughs> almost everything that I teach or my one-on-one -on -one sessions is like, okay, but also like grief is present here with the pleasure exploration or the new knowledge of your body or, you know, whatever it may be that we're working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's like kind of what I do in the world in Portland, Oregon, on Christmas and college land, staying in person and virtual uh, work in these, in these ways. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing to note too. Jess is in Portland, and I got to go and see you this year you in did. your you home. In my home, in my garden. Yeah. Grief. Grief is a release. It's just like, it's like, an orgasm, but mm -hmm. in a different spectrum, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. What, what brought you, like what brought that into your lineage for SSE for you? Mm. Yeah. So like, it's a, it's a two, I feel like it was a two part uh, initiation is probably an accurate word, but like a two part, like unfolding. I was Christian, evangelical Christian for 25 years, I'm 40, about to be 41 now. So <laughs> over half my life. And when I left the church in my mid twenties, like that loss of community of presumed connection to the divine of my path forward in life, all, you know, like <laughs> we could go on and on mm -hmm. my hands are gesturing wildly <laughs> as I talk about this. like in an immense an immense amount of grief and in the like ways that Christianity in particular sets up and in evangelical Christianity sets up a like 
we are good we are chosen and then everybody else is separate and then and them and othered I became sensely othered and so somehow in that process I don't even remember how but like masturbation had been a part of my life for a while at this point like and of course doing it and then asking for forgiveness and doing it and asking for forgiveness because you're not supposed to be sexual in that way wow and so like utilizing this thing that I had that I knew that was good and true for me and then I realized that like as I was riding the waves of pleasure and orgasm that like all of these feelings were also coming out of like wanting to scream and cry and all of this stuff and I kept checking in and being like it's kind of weird but I think I feel like I feel okay and I feel safe I feel safe and I feel Mm -hmm. like I guess we'll just keep doing this thing Mm -hmm. you know and not having really anybody to talk to about it also having no like experience of talking about any sort of sexual thing at all other than like don't have it until you're married <laughs> like wow <laughs> you know we can talk about it when you have a fiance and like you're getting to that point like that's when a lot of times um people in my christian community would finally get to start to talk about sex like people would be preparing them for the marriage bed and so like just had this weird secret thing that my body did that was like pleasure and grief release and so like that kind of tucked away for a long time (laughs) and that's initially why I got into this work because I was like oh like I imagine doing that while also having a supportive person there or to process or something like like the feeling of being alone in that is really overwhelming Mm -hmm. um so that's kind of what started me on this journey here. And then right before COVID started, so January 2020, it's funny because I tell this story a lot. And I'm like, but this is a really fucking pivotal story. Like, <laughs> of course, like this is, I called it an initiation. Yeah, the third week of January, I broke up with a partner, one of my other partners, or yeah, partner partners, let me know that they were moving away from Portland I had a friend die unexpectedly in an accident and then one of my other partners (laughs) got fired from their job which was one of like my very safe like like my second home in the city all within seven days oh wow and so like I I mean I just shut down yeah yeah that makes sense and so in all of that and the complications of queerness and loving many people all at once like the partner that I broke up with was also somewhat partnered with the person who died like (laughs) yeah you know so like we're navigating like we're not together anymore but also we need to grieve together this and this and all of all of that so I had flown down to Oakland to be with the community of people that knew the person who had passed like our connected community and was out at a restaurant with my friend Elena and (laughs) I don't remember the name of it it's a very good little like farm to table cafe in Oakland and they make bone broth and vegetable broth like that are out of this world good (laughs) like they're (laughs) so so good and I am a little bit of a slut for broth. So I broth slut. <laughs> yeah. It's true. I food is really important <laughs> to my pleasure. And so I ordered the bone broth with like whatever at protein and vegetable additions. And I guess I'll step back a little bit. Like my go-to in trauma and in overwhelm is like freeze dissociate. Yeah. And I am a person who I learned, I'm going to forget the term right now, but I learned this recently. Like, it's like the trauma response version of functioning alcoholic. Like I'm in a frozen state, but you would probably not know that because I'm 
interacting and engaging in the world. Yeah. And so fully dissociated <laughs> from all of these losses. I take a like spoonful of the broth and just start weeping. Wow. And I was like, <laughs> and then like in thinking about it, I was like, oh, like you have been in all of these trainings and all of this school, like connecting more and more to your embodied pleasure. And so like you love food. This is a pleasure center for you. You receive that embodied pleasure and it like snapped you out or like or brought you back through like yeah the dissociation back into the body and was like Mm -hmm. oh no you need to crack like like, that's what needs to happen right now and I was like oh shit this is (laughs) this is a thing and so like had that like little nugget of information and then a few months after that I attended a workshop by a now no longer existing organization called Being Here Human out of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And they were doing non-pathological grief support education. And their description of that, of grief, is that it is a automatic embodied experience that the body does in relationship to a loss. So like Mm. similar to digestion, like when you need to process the food, your body digests. When you're ready to give birth to a baby, labor begins. When you experience a loss, grief starts in your body. And then they described like how to metabolize grief as like movement, sound, and a way to share the story. Mm. Like that those things need are needed for grief ritual, grief metabolization. And I was like, oh, well, fucking pleasure. Like movement and sound is so much a part of pleasure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like whether like we're moving our bodies, we're breathing, we're laughing, we're moaning, we're and I was like shaking, shaking, yeah. yeah, ding, 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 ding. Yeah. And so I was like, huh. So like putting all the pieces together and being like, this is no wonder that's what my body was doing yeah. like when I was 25 and no wonder that's how it like connected in because I'm you know I imagine like if I were a dancer and not a sex coach like dance would have been the way in mm-hmm. where if like for me it was food pleasure because mm-hmm. I've, I've honed that erotically <laughs> me too <laughs> right I love food yeah so good it's so good. Mm-hmm. And so then thinking about like, well, what are the things that we all have inside of us that can help us connect into that? Like you might want to go chop firewood or walk your dog or. So is that kind of what you bring it into like the mindful erotic grief practice? Yeah. And it's, it's community, right? It's not just like one-on-one. It's like a group of people online. Online. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A group of people There are a handful of folks that show up pretty regularly, but it's often like a a fresh mix of mostly strangers, Mm -hmm. which is also, I think, really, there's something beautiful about like showing up and being like, I'm going to let a complete stranger hold me, even if I don't say anything, like Mm -hmm. I'm going to let them hold me. But the invitation in that practice is like, where is your grief in your body? If you can locate it. And then what does it need today? And can you give a little or a lot of that to your grief? Mm -hmm. And so like, sometimes people like lay face down on the floor and that's all they do. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Sometimes people have multiple orgasms. Sometimes people make dinner, go for a walk, like scream into a pillow, into a pillow. (laughs) Have full, like I've had people have full kink scenes with themselves. Like, yeah you know and so it really is like with the tools and resources that you have and what you know about your body and can you touch into what the grief like how that wants to be expressed yeah that's super important because we often just dissociate from that uncomfortable feeling of grief yeah or it's supposed to look a certain way like you know you're supposed to cry or you're supposed to do this you know whatever the your cultural version of that is and that everybody's experience and body is different 
and having the space to be like, well, what is it that I want to do? Mm-hmm. Like today I want to color with colored pencils. Next week I'm going to look like fucking Tai Bo, like just punching the air because I don't have a punching bag and I want to like right. and beat the shit out of something. And knowing you're not alone yeah. because that's a big thing that you touched on was it can be kind of lonely. Yeah. Moving through noticing the grief in your body and also feeling like so isolated and alone with it that's that in itself brings up grief yeah that's like another layer to add to it and I've been there by myself with grief and it's not easy to do it alone and that's why community is so important but often when we're in those states of feeling grief or overwhelm or sadness, we tend to withdraw because we don't want to put too much on somebody else's plate yeah. because we don't feel, we don't want to feel like we're projecting onto them. They already have enough stuff going on. Like who am I to take up more of their space and time? And that's, yeah, that's my experience anyways. Yeah. I, I think that's a pretty common experience. Yeah. Um, and I think part of that too is that there aren't I mean culturally for me like white Christian Americans there's a funeral mm-hmm. for, a, for a death and that's the that's the only grief ritual that I have experienced that I have not created for myself and that's not very satisfying no honestly for me like I know I know that some funerals like have a lot more integration and connection and that sort of thing but the ones I have been to have been very much like they're with God now yeah they're in a better place and completely bypassing the like the real loss of like a spouse father (laughs) grandfather yeah and the realities of that you know and so the reason that I do this every two weeks is so that like people can show up and like they're like for this hour and a half on Wednesday evenings, I can do this. I can, I can, I can be as loud or as whatever weird weepy silent as I want to be about this thing because it's okay in this space. Mm -hmm. And so that there's like somewhere to go, Mm -hmm. you know, and of course it's not for everybody, which is why I'm like always constantly being like, all right, (laughs) these are the ingredients, like movement sound, sharing the story, like can you create grief ritual in your own family, community, spiritual group? Because, you know, being online with a bunch of strangers, potentially masturbating is not <laughs> like it's not everybody's cup of tea. Right. Of course, you know, but like a monthly dance, like grief dance party, that could be a thing or yeah. like come or cooking together. together. That was exactly I was like come together and make a favorite recipe of yeah. someone who has passed or someone who you used to be in a relationship with. Yeah. Like what you know, getting creative with like what in that relational connection to whatever the loss was, like how can you kind of keep tending that that space? Yeah. And maybe where was it? There was like this grief quote that I read some time ago. You know, like I've lost beings in my life that are very close to me. And it was like, it's like this tidal wave. You're on this little boat, this plank in the water, and it's just wave after wave after wave. And there's no end in sight, but eventually, like, the waves get smaller. And then sometimes, like, an anniversary or a birthday comes and it's like (laughs) a big one again. But, you know, recognizing those days and maybe creating a grief ritual that day like me and my girlfriend my god brother we lost when we were 14 and like even how like how long has it been over 20 years Mm -hmm. and we'll like walk to a special bench or go for a special dinner that that day the two of us and that's like our grief ritual that we we plan so things like that and acknowledging and not trying to dissociate and do it alone (laughs) yeah Mm -hmm. and sometimes dissociating is exactly what needs to happen like I think the inviting more possibility 
in is helpful and also like the loss can be so immense that like we just need to not be here for a little bit Mm -hmm. and that's okay yeah and like can we come back to the body at some point yeah that's a good point there's no wrong way (laughs) to navigate I, I, I but like not hurting yourself I would say is you know try to have some tenderness and love to yourself and not hurt yourself but yeah yeah I'm curious like how tending to your grief or acknowledging grief can help relationships in your life and intimacy like do you find that people who are acknowledging the grief even even if it means you're not doing anything but it like even when you look at couples, if, if somebody's grieving and the other partner doesn't know what to do or how to support that, like what happens there? I think like part of it is doing a little bit of education around like, like let's say your partner lost their parent or their job or yeah. you know, like, we'll, we'll just say lost their parent. Well, we'll keep it simple. When <laughs> A simple, a simple death loss, which is not simple, but like doing a little bit of education around like what supporting a grieving person looks like. And that like, I touched a little bit on, on that, like some people will just be a bucket of tears mm-hmm. and some people will, you know, like you see movies and stories with like closets full of clothes that are there for like. 15 years after someone has passed and so like how thinking into how can you come alongside their mode of grief you know whatever whatever it might be and then also like you know there's like the intellectual version of that there's the emotional version of that there's kind of the physical like I'm going to really get into running or you know right and if you notice that person kind of I don't want to say getting stuck but kind of centering one more than the other like how can you invite them into a more emotive response and some like and sometimes that is like this is not your work like your work is to keep them fed and right support like household tasks or getting kids to school right and finding a professional right because there's also your own capacity and what you can hold and need to hold and care for yourself so that you can show up for yourself and everybody else Mm -hmm. and I think also like there's no timeline (laughs) I mean which you (laughs) like very beautifully described but like you know bereavement leave if you have a job that has that is like a few days right bullshit and then you're supposed to be back to work and then there was a beautiful book written in the 60s on the stages of grief that was very specifically for people who had a terminal illness diagnosis and then it has gotten laid over every other kind of loss right and so they're like oh well when you have a breakup these are the five stages of grief that you go through. And really it was like a very specific set of research on a very specific population of people who knew that they were dying from mm-hmm. illness. And so people are like, oh, well, I'm in stage three, so I should be done soon. And really it's like, well, last week for grief practice or two weeks ago, I guess it is now, was the day after one of my childhood friends, this 23 year death anniversary, which like, the last few years no big deal this year I could barely hold it together to hold the grief Mm -hmm. space which like is also how that works right like (laughs) and thankfully at this point I've done it enough that my body like can do it but it's like oh this year Cole's death is very present and it's been almost two and a half decades since he's been gone and and people might beat themselves up about that. Yeah. They might be like, why, why now? Like, what's wrong with me? Yeah. Or, or why are you still sad about this? Right. You know, like 
like we get to have our emotional experience with the loss for however long it is for however Mm -hmm. it looks Mm -hmm. which you know comes back to like we're not very good at holding our own pain or each other's pain (laughs) I know it's true so it's not like I don't want to villainize anybody for not being able to or wanting to but like it's hard it's hard to see our loved ones in so much pain it is yeah yeah what about some like taboos that society has associated with grief and sensuality or (laughs) the erotic being and you know I can't remember exactly what movie it was I just watched I'm trying to think of it Oh, no, wait, it was a book. I was reading Outlander and she was really sad. And she like saw her husband. She's like, I need you right now. Like, I just need to be fucked. And <laughs> even though I'm like crying and like it was really hot sex scene, but I don't think like as society, we like think that's okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. And that is like, it's actually like a very common response to grief where like either like and I don't want to like binary anything but like a lot of times people like will shut down sexually or get hypersexual and it is a normal thing that bodies do and again like kind of going back to the like the harm piece and the safety piece like within that are you making safe choices for yourself or not like of course like harm reduction risk analysis risk analysis like can you one out of 10 times remember to use a barrier like if that like if part of your thing is like I just need it now and I can't think through all of the other stuff like what are the ways that you can minimize risk to yourself in that and maybe you can't and that's that's also fine but like having more erotic energy is a completely normal experience within that I think there's also the like you're not supposed to be joyful. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's a big one. There's a way that your grief is you're supposed to perform your grief. Yeah. And keep it clean and tidy and you know, whatever. Like I remember being down in California for Brooke's funeral. And like so many people there were just very much in the like weeping space very like (laughs) of course absolutely and then my ex and my dear friend and I we like we were processing that grief and trauma with laughter right which was not really welcome by everybody else yeah like dirty looks (laughs) I'm I'm assuming like Yeah. yeah you know but it's like like what my body needs to do is to like be with people that I love and care about like I like off gas is almost the word that I want to use, but like vent the steam or like release the pressure of, of the pain and laughter was, was the avenue for us in that moment. Mm -hmm. Which in our society isn't labeled as grief. No. Right. Yeah. Or it's rude. Like, yeah, exactly. like, Like that was inappropriate for us to be over in the corner laughing hysterically about things. I mean, we're just as sad as you are. She's coming out different. And yeah, I think that part of it, not wanting to, t- like if someone has died or if there's been a breakup, not wanting to talk about the person for fear of like, <laughs> oh, it's going to make you think about it and make you sad. Well, not actually I'm constantly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like somebody bringing it up to you kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And I think like it reminds me of consent work and like who is it for? And well, it is for the griever. Right. And so like, is the laughter what needs to happen? Do they want to talk about their dead child? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Like, Mm -hmm. but ask, like, or say, like, I don't know where you're at with this, but like if you want a space to talk about your kid, your spouse, your whomever, like, yeah, (laughs) I'd be happy to hear stories about that Mm -hmm. if and when you're ready, because I think that's part of the loneliness too, of like people not wanting to upset someone. 
and then like talking about like that death and breakup but then there's also like the grief of losing a job the grief of not getting into the school that you wanted the grief of being a woman in society a black person in america a queer person Mm -hmm. in the world like navigating all of those other the griefs that we don't that aren't (laughs) i'm using air quotes which is obnoxious but that are not important are not as like valid yeah as like a death which is complete bullshit Mm -hmm. but then it also like that means where does your grief get to go like it becomes disenfranchised and you don't have an outlet yeah or a space yeah which is why like my my circles are like all grief is welcome like if you're in a custody battle if you like the forest near your house got torn down for a development if like your mom died when you were four yeah all of it gets to be there I even like attended one of your mindful erotic grief practices and that was shortly after my dog fell off the cliff when I was at core course Mm -hmm. four and I got COVID Victoria and like all of everything in my life just like came to a halt. And then it meant all summer I had to spend at home tending to an injured dog and spend an exorbitant amount of money. And I didn't finish core course four. And like, I felt like, yeah, it wasn't that grief wasn't tended to and acknowledged in the same way that a death would have been or a job loss would have been. Yeah. Yeah. And that was hard and it was lonely. Yeah. And that was like the shittiest summer of my life. Even COVID didn't even match that. <laughs> and COVID brought up a lot of grief for a lot of folks in that way too, I feel. It did. And <laughs> I I, <laughs> I think most people still don't believe that that's grief. <laughs> Yeah, it was great. There was <laughs> so much grief for me around it. Yeah, yeah. I But that, I think, is reflective of, like, how much we don't want to be in grief. Or others to be in grief. Yeah. We're like, no, don't don't bring that in here. This is uncomfortable. Yeah. This is sticky for me. Yeah, you don't get to go to high school graduation that you've been, like, looking forward to your whole life. Like, right. it's no big deal. Yeah. It's no big yeah. deal. You still graduated. Or the opposite. Now you have to go back into the office. Yeah. And you enjoyed working from home and you're grieving having to go back into the office to work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so much grief. It doesn't get labeled as that. So little acknowledgement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I think kind of going back to the question that started this part of the conversation off of like, the erotic and sensuality and all of that of like it just feels I mean outside of the circles that we run in I think it feels weird for me to be like I have a practice called mindful erotic grief and people are like erotic <laughs> grief <laughs> mm-hmm. and you know or like that like your pleasure could be present in your grief process Mm-hmm. if you want it to be and I think that's a huge taboo like bringing sex into anything that isn't like a very small window of what that's supposed to be is taboo yeah totally and so then being like yeah sure like maybe let's orgasm with your grief yeah some people are like yeah okay let's go <laughs> game on <laughs> but I think most people are just like ooh yeah, because it's so taboo. Mm-hmm. And the other, like, I don't know, I was talking to a colleague of ours about this the other day of like, you know, describing our work in general and then this particular grief practice of like, it's mindful erotic grief. So we want pleasure to show up if it can, if it wants to, but it's a meditation. And then it's a practice around a playlist where you're on Zoom in your own home with your camera off. And it just sounds like 
kind of weird and kind of boring. And then like, and sometimes that's the experience for people. And then other times they're like, holy fucking shit. I didn't know like this was transformative. I'm like, it's this weird alchemy of like letting everything be present Mm -hmm. or be present however it wants to be with no, with no pressure to be different. And so like every, every part of you gets a seat at the table is really important in the grief process. Yeah. That's a great reminder. Hmm. So thinking in like acknowledging grief and how it, how it comes up for you and what you need and not trying to fit your grief into the societal description of what it is. How does that improve the relationship with yourself or your relationship with other people around you? I think like with myself, it's just like reminding and allowing me that I get to be fully human Mm -hmm. yeah and then like I guess at this point it's been a year and a half of doing this mindful erotic grief practice wow which is wild crazy (laughs) yeah I had no idea (laughs) it's so wild but then like I notice I mean and again like I am the facilitator like I'm I'm marketing it and then I'm also like creating, usually create a new playlist every time. Sometimes I use old playlists, but like I'm like collecting songs and I'm like based on what's going on in the world, the playlist is very much curated for like what's of the moment. Like when the orca started attacking <laughs> the yachts, there was a song about orcas on. Like it was just like, like we're just pulling and we're like putting all these things. Like, like, so that part of it is a magic and like, that's the like ritual space that I've created to create the ritual space. But I also noticed that like my body now knows that like Wednesday evenings is time to grieve. Mm-hmm. And so like, I can start to feel like things shifting and opening and preparing to be like, this is the time to do the feels. Mm-hmm. And I think that you know, like it's any other practice. Like if you like to work out and you go to the gym or you do yoga or you sit in your garden with your coffee every morning or you know, like walk your walk your dog, like your body starts to know and like kind of have that physiological response to that space. That makes sense. Yeah. And it's like that part of it. But then it's also like I now have tools in a way that I didn't used to of like oh this is overwhelming let me go jerk off about it or this is overwhelming let me go (laughs) like get out my crayons and make a drawing about it I remember and like to be fair I've worked from home for forever and so I have a lot of like privacy in my like working day but like the first year and a half of COVID which was the first year and a half after all of those losses Mm -hmm. I would just have tantrums like I just like I am overwhelmed with feeling and I just need to like cry and stomp about it Mm -hmm. and I could because I worked from like I could get up from my computer and be like I'm gonna go have a tantrum (laughs) and then come back but like having that tool in my box having that resource of I'm experiencing noticing this is a loss like how do I support that has really like helped me be able to meet it rather than like numb out about it unless I really need to and he said yeah this sucks let's go garden (laughs) right or let me like let me send a voice note to this friend because I know they can hold that that emotion for me interesting it's funny you say that because even like when all that stuff happened with Hank that was the one thing my body just told me it needed. I was like, I need to go buy plants. And that's the first year I created my pride garden. Yeah. And like, and just like, I didn't usually I'll wear gloves, didn't wear gloves. It's like my hands were so disgusting and dirty and dried out from the soil, but it was very cathartic. Is that the word? Mm-hmm. Yeah. For me to just 
because it's the only thing we could do was be in the backyard. Yeah. And so I could bring him out there. I could have him on the leash so I could hold him so he didn't run. And I just gardened for like four days straight after coming back from Victoria. Yeah. And that <laughs> must have been taking care of my grief. And I didn't even yes. realize that until now. <laughs> Yeah, I got a little teary eyed as you were saying that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, interesting. And then I got to like be in the garden all summer because it's not like you plant it and you're done. You have to water, you have to pinch back, you have to deadhead and just watched it bloom and then watched it die as fall came around and winter hit and the first yeah. frost came and but at that time, I feel like I moved through a lot of the grief through gardening. And then October came and I was back out in Victoria. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it came full circle. And you have a pride garden this year, right? Like, and your body was like, that was a nice thing for me to do. Mm -hmm. Let me do it again. Mm -hmm. But it totally wasn't this, the same mm -hmm. emotion or feeling. It was way different this year. Interesting that I just noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Being human is so funny. <laughs> it blows my mind every day. So what are your, like, what's your vision going forward with this? What, what um, do you, what's future Jess <laughs> have on the plate? <laughs> I, this question is making me laugh because I, I'm in the middle, early middle. Early middle, of, I like it. Yeah. I feel like middle feels too generous. <laughs> of like rewriting a bunch of copy for my website because I do like, there is the grief that exists in erotic space and in the like somatic sex education. And like when that comes up in session and like being able to hold that, but then like also wanting specific offerings that are like hey you're grieving how can we connect you more to your body and that help you create rituals around that and so I need to write the copy make <laughs> make like, us like a blog post session offering no like like having it be like a type of session that you can hire me for perfect okay and so like what are the words I want on my website to describe what I do so that people can be like, this sounds nice, or this is not the grief person for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like, I want to transi transition into more, like being able to hold one-on-one -on -one space there and then finding different ways to hold group grief space that I don't know what it looks like yet. I really am a huge, like, I want to do some stuff in person, but I really love the online piece because it is like, yes, we're here in community, but like you are in your home with all of the things that you like, your bed is there, your partner's mm -hmm. there, your animals are there, all of your favorite foods. If you're, <laughs> if you've gone grocery shopping recently are there. And so like the resourcing is different when you get to be in your home space. Yeah. And I also like, there's something about the like practitioner, facilitator, client dynamic that I sometimes feel like people are like, oh, I can only grieve if I'm in Jess's office, or I can only feel this type of pleasure if I'm on Jess's table. But it's like, oh, but if you feel that grief and experience that pleasure in your own home, then it's actually real in your space. Mm-hmm. Like the permission they give themselves would just be around your space. Yeah. It's like, oh, I have to go here to do this thing. And it's like, well, no, I got to yeah. do this thing in my own living room or in my own bed. Mm -hmm. And both like both are good. But I'm like, there's always that like, this is this is not something that just lives in my house. It lives in your house too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah. So that's kind of that and then keep doing mindful erotic grief because it like one for me it's a necessary practice um it feels a lot like our friend colleague teacher captain like their twice weekly thing like like 
that it's for the community, but it's also for them. Like, mm-hmm. it's like this is for the community, but it also like it started because I was like, I need to grieve with people and we're in a pandemic and how do we do this? Yeah. Zoom. Zoom. <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> yeah. And I also like my ideal, which again is edgy, is to like that orgasmic grief masturbation space that I was describing with myself, like having that be one of like the session options for people to come and be in with me. Yeah. And create like create ritual space, whether that's in person or virtual, right? But like having a, a present witness and support in that. That's on that's on the offering menu. And again, like finding the words to write the copy for the website to describe that feels precious and tricky. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I know I'm such a word person too. I could spend hours like looking at cinema, 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 Yeah. (laughs) It's my dyslexia. (laughs) I can see the word. I can't pronounce it. Yeah. Yeah. I words are so impactful to me. You know, sometimes I use chat GPT for that just for inspiration. Mm -hmm. I I'm too much of a control freak to be like, I have to tell you how to do this thing that I could do myself. (laughs) AI. Hey, it's helped me. I know. I know it would be helpful. (laughs) I've watched many people in my life be like, this is amazing. It's like having an assistant. It's so helpful. And I'm like, "Mm, okay. I'm really kind to mine though. I'm like, this isn't exactly what I had in mind. Can you please revise it to do A, B, and C? And it's like, yeah, sure thing here. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. I mean, I think that's smart because if they ever become sentient, you want to have been nice to your yeah. your AI. Yeah. They're like Tara passed. She. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tara, Tara is a friend, not a foe. <laughs> she minded her P's and Q's. Mm-hmm. While I crossed the I's or dotted the I's and crossed the T's. <laughs> uh, yeah. So before we go into the wrap up, I did have one IG question, which we kind of touched on, but I just wanted to mention it. Yeah. Somebody asked, is it common to be turned on when one is very sad? Yeah. Underneath that question is like, am I okay? Am I normal? Is this weird? Mm -hmm. And the answer is you are normal. It is not weird. (laughs) Like that is something that people experience. Some people don't. But if that is what is happening in your body, like give it some space and some support and find some people to help you you turn on if you want that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or focus on yourself with that, like do a masturbation or self-pleasure practice around, around that. Right. Yeah. I don't think you need to get like too deep into the why and like, Mm -mm. I think it's just noticing, noticing, trusting, valuing, communicating to yourself or partners or lovers or whoever that that's coming up for you and sometimes just acknowledging it you know feeds it what it needs yeah you know like instead of like oh I don't want to go there I don't want to go there I don't want to go there okay it's here and then your body's just like okay thanks yeah (laughs) I am turned on I'm sad (laughs) I contain multitudes. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I also, I'm going to plug our work here that like, if that is your experience and it feels too hard to like ask your partner or your lover to hold that space, like folks that do the work that we do or people who do full service sex work, like that is a beautiful outlet to like be like this is a need I have let me like be supported by a professional mm-hmm. around this and all that to say like if you are hiring a full service sex worker for that mentioning that when you get into the session <laughs> the session that's usually more often on our our intakes because we're tracking for loss and complicated feelings around sex but there are options outside of yeah that and oftentimes I think we can be more more real in spaces 
where we're anonymous. True. And so there's certain classes I teach where I'm like, eh, don't come with your partner. Because <laughs> you get to show up as your whole self, right? Mm-hmm. And or like or do like that that is your choice. But like I tend to advocate for the relationship with yourself first. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's a great, that's a great timbit of information too. It's not your partner's responsibility to be the person to always hold that space for you. And sometimes it does help to work with somebody. And some people are really afraid of going to talk therapists or they're just like, oh, Mm -hmm. this never worked for me. I've tried it. I mean, I've tried it for things like grief and it wasn't helpful for me. But going to somebody who did somatic experiencing, that was my first Mm -hmm. time ever noticing and playing around with somatics. It's like, wow, this is way more healing for my body and noticing ginormous shifts in ways that I like with such subtle practices too. Yeah. Like it doesn't have to be like this big ginormous thing, but yeah, I think finding different professionals and having a support team that isn't just your partner or partners, you know, that just expands the safety net for you a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. So Jess, how can people find you? Ooh, that one. <laughs> <laughs> so I am most active on my website and Instagram. So website is www.belovedcoaching.net. So B-E-L-O-V-E-D coaching.net. <laughs> Instagram is the backslash beloved coaching. I am also on Facebook, also on Twitter, very inactive on both of those. You're on Twitter? I didn't know that. Yeah. I I rarely po- post, but yeah, I think I'm beloved coaching on Twitter. Or X, I guess X, it's called I was just these days. <laughs> <laughs> Which, yeah, I'm like, that's so hilarious, Elon, that you chose the gender neutral gender marker as your right? <laughs> as your new but whatever. Yeah, so I'm all of those places. Mindful erotic grief is every other Wednesday until I decide that's not what I want to do anymore. So I'm always there. And yeah, mm-hmm. if you're in Portland, Vancouver, Washington area, I realized the other day I know enough Canadians at this point that I have to be very clear if I'm teaching in Washington versus Vancouver, BC. Yep. <laughs> I was also one of the people who was confused, but I don't know who thought of putting like two Vancouver's so close together, but yeah, they definitely. just in different countries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you can get to on a single train. Yeah. You can get to both of them on the same train. <laughs> yeah. So if you are in Portland, Southwest Washington area, I'm also available in person sessions Mm. well thank you jess thank you so much for today i can't believe how quickly the time flew by yeah i feel like i well i'm hoping that a lot of people find some value in this and you know if something sounded like you wanted to join the mindful erotic grief practice that's all on your website Mm -hmm. and also on twitter or on Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. It's not on Twitter. Yeah. X. It's not not on X. It's not on Twitter. Yeah. Instagram Um, and and the website or the news. I have a newsletter also. Um, You have a newsletter too, which I really like. From both of those places. Yeah. 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 So sign up for Jess's newsletter so you can stay in the know of all of the exciting things that are coming up for you and your business. Mm -hmm. Treat, treat, treat. <laughs> and thank you to all of the amazing listeners for tuning in to the sex ed for the modern bed show if you're looking for more ways to connect access info all that sort of stuff you can get social with me my show instagram is the dot sex ed dot show or my individual one is sex ed for the modern bed until next time claim your pleasure own your body and stay in presence mm-hmm.